Start the recording. All right. Happy Friday. We did it. Well, I guess we're not done yet, but we're so close. So close. All right. I just want to do a, a quick review uh, because it's such a short class, and I do want to talk about formal hypothesis testing for two sample proportions, right? But we introduced uh, the two sample proportions types of questions. Well, so how we work with two sample proportions is we're gonna be interested in how P1 relates to P2 and how we do that is looking at the difference. So our point estimate then is gonna be P1 hat, oh, that doesn't look like a hat, minus P2 hat. It's our best guess at what P1 minus P2 might look like, all right? And so that's all, all fine and good. And the standard error of P1 hat minus P2 hat is gonna be the square root of P1 Q1 oops, over N1, oh my gosh, plus P2 Q2 over N2. We had, this is the same problem that we had before, right? Where we took a sample, so we have sample information and we're trying to learn about the population. So relying on the population doesn't really help us. So for, uh, for confidence intervals, we use P1 hat and P2 hat, right? So these, just get little hats and we just grab them from the sample, right? And then just from our general knowledge about a confidence interval, confidence interval is the point estimate plus minus, uh, I'll use Z star for now, because that's all we've seen, times, later I'll replace it with a critical value, generic. Uh, and then times the standard error of the point estimate. And that's where we got that formula from before, right? So the point estimate is P1 hat minus P2 hat plus minus, and I like to wrap brackets around that just to, to remind myself that that's actually one number, right? the difference, plus minus Z star, which we know how to find times the square root of P1 hat Q1 hat over N1 plus P2 hat Q2 hat over N2. Remembering that when we interpret the interval, we're talking about the difference in the proportions, right? And so I'll make a note of that here. When interpreting, the interval, be sure to talk about the difference in proportions, right? This interval is for the difference. So when interpreting the interval, it is important to remember that this interval, that this interval is for the difference in proportions. Depending on how you calculated which one you made group one and which one you made group two, right? That's going to play a role in your interpretation, right? But that's gonna be question specific. Then what we introduced is uh, the fact that we can use a confidence interval to do an informal hypothesis test. Right? So we can uh, use a CI, a confidence interval, to do an informal hypothesis test. So what we do is, of course, I still need my null hypothesis, but that's all I need. Right, so we need our null hypothesis 
And from the formula sheet, just grab it here or show you at least. Our formula sheet, I use P1 is equal to P2, right? But if I wanna talk about the differences, that's gonna be the same as P1 minus P2 equals zero, right? So if we wanna talk about the differences, then our null hypothesis. So what's really nice about two sample proportions is this will always be your null hypothesis, right? Is that P1 is equal to P2 or the null hypothesis is that P1 minus P2 is equal to zero. The difference between these two is nothing because they are basically the same, right? And so, um, or not significantly different from zero is what we would say. They don't have to be exactly the same, but they're not significantly different. So then what we can do with this zero, because our confidence interval is about this difference, right? If the null hypothesized value is in the interval, that's the same as, okay, well then yeah, zero is one of the options. So then I cannot reject H naught. Okay. So here, this is the null hypothesized value. I'll never understand why the Friday class is the most popular one. Because it's so quick. Because we have all classes on Fridays. All classes on Fridays. Aha. Aha. And this is the one you look forward to the most. <laughs> Just happens to be midday. We're here, Emily. All right, all right. All right. So then if the null hypothesized value is within the interval, right? Is within the interval. Right, the confidence interval is what I mean. Okay. We do not have enough evidence to reject H naught, right? We're 95% confident that the true difference in proportions is somewhere in here and zero is one of the options. So then that's not enough evidence to reject H naught. So if the null hypothesized value is within the interval, we do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. I like to kind of visualize it with a number line, right? And so if my interval kind of goes from negative one to positive two, then of course a difference of zero is in here, right? So then I'm 95% confident that zero can be an option for the difference in proportions, right? Versus, and maybe I'll, yeah, sure versus if you have something like this, where it's uh, negative three to negative one, then of course zero is outside that range, right? And so here, right, we have enough evidence to reject H naught in favor of HA. So that's where we finished off last day and we uh, really pushed the, the limit on the time here, right? But we had our interval is consistently negative. So the difference is negative always, right? Or we're 95% confident that the true difference in proportions is negative, right? Not zero, which would mean that they're the same. So then, since this uh, zero is not in the interval, we have enough evidence to reject H naught in favor of HA, which means that the difference is significantly different from zero. What we established was that you can only really use a confidence interval for a two-sided test because of the nature of the interval, right? It's going to be a two-sided test, but uh, I think that's taking it too far. Okay. Good. Formal hypothesis testing. Let's, 
let's do that voodoo that we do here. It's the end of the review. So now formal hypothesis testing. for two sample proportions. Okay. I'm gonna grab the formula sheet just so we have it. And also uh, there's a lot of clues on here. Maybe too many clues arguably makes it look kind of big and scary. So our hypothesis test for P1 minus P2, that's what we want to learn about. Okay, our null hypothesis will always be that P1 is equal to P2. Same rules apply, right? The null hypothesis has an equal sign, right? And then the default is not equal to in the alternative. Or if you want, you can write, so here, or that's the same as the null hypothesis is that P1 minus P2 is equal to zero, right? If P1 is equal to P2, the difference is zero, right? And the default then would be that P1 oops, minus P2 is not equal to zero. We can talk about the difference being less than zero or greater than zero if you want, but the default, remember, is not equal to zero. They're different from each other. Okay. So what we said was, okay, we kind of mentioned it last day, but we're going to have, okay, P1 hat and P2 hat in our Z calculation, right? Which is step two of the hypothesis test still, right? It's just how we get to Z is different. But once we have a Z, it behaves the same as the Zs that we've seen before. So then we're kind of on easy street again, right? It's just this one major change, I guess. But then we have this P hat, Q hat, and where P hat is the pooled proportion. Okay? So that's when we combine all our successes and the total numbers, we throw everyone in the pool and it doesn't matter which group you're from, we use this pooled uh, number of successes and failures. Right. And if you prefer, you can even say P hat is going to be X1 plus X2 over N1 plus N2. Should add that to the formula sheet, making it even scarier looking, I guess. But it's just to help you out, right? Notice that this formula sheet has two different ways of calculating Z. The only difference being that I've distributed to the P hat, Q hat. So depending on how you want to calculate Z, completely up to you. I tend to use the first one, right? Because then I don't need to worry about the P hat, Q hat more than once, but that's up to you. But these, these are the same, obviously. So what I want to do is just grab from, uh, da, 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 da. Here, the textbook, the explanation or sort of, sort of explanation of the pooled proportion. So it says use the pooled proportion when H naught is that P1 minus P2 is equal to zero. Okay. It's possible to do, okay, the difference is, is 0.1. Right, the difference is 0.05, the difference is 0.2, whatever. We're never gonna do that. And most scenarios, we just wanna know how it relates to zero. So in this course, this will always, oops, always be the case in this course and honestly in most scenarios. There's a, an example in, in the textbook at the end of the section where they talk about the difference being 0.1, I think, 
where I, yeah, it's something about airplanes and the difference. It wasn't good enough to be significantly different. The difference had to be uh, more than 0.1. But for us, this will always be the case, which means that we're always going to use the pooled proportion. So when the null hypothesis is that the proportions are equal, which is what we are always going to have, use the pooled proportion to verify the success failure condition and to estimate the standard error. Yeah. So our conditions for hypothesis testing are the same but different as before. Okay, so the conditions for hypothesis testing. The first one is still independence, right? Randomly sampling ensures that we have independence within and between the groups, right? So uh, random sampling ensures independence, oops within, oops, within and between the groups. When we have two groups, right, it's not good enough to just assume independence within each group, but also between the groups, they can't be related uh, between the groups. There are scenarios, so there are tools, if you don't have independence between the groups, there are tools that we're not going to mention here, but they exist, right? So then you would have a different thing that you could use. Yeah. Uh, the success failure condition, we said, and this is, we talked about this last day too, right? N1 times P hat has to be greater than or equal to 10. So that's what it means here right? Use the pooled proportion to verify the success failure condition. Yeah. So here we've used p hat and then n1 times q hat. You do still have to check uh, both samples n2 times p hat has to be greater than or equal to 10 and n2 times q hat has to be greater than or equal to 10. All right. So we just, which means that we're gonna need the pooled proportion before we can proceed, All right? Which is kind of similar to uh, hypothesis testing for one sample proportion. We had to have the hypothesized proportion to check it. Okay. Um, gone completely off script here. Let me see if I can get caught up here. Okay. I think we're ready for an example. Oh, no. I wasn't quite done. And estimate the standard error, right? And so the standard error, I want to keep it on the same page. So here, this means that the standard error of P1 hat minus P2 hat for a hypothesis test, right? Or in general, what we're working with is P1, Q1 over N1, but we don't have P1, P2, Q2. We don't have P2 either over N2. So instead of that, we're going to swap these out for just the pooled proportion. P hat Q hat over N1 plus P hat Q hat over N2. But that's on your formula sheet, so you don't need to remember that. But that's where it came from. That's why it's on your formula sheet. OK. So I think we're ready for an example. And it's about sleep deprivation again. There's a theme, I think. Oh, yeah, here's the the special case, so it's a special topic 
where P1 minus P2 is equal to 0.1 instead of zero. So if you're interested, then a quadcopter, no wonder I couldn't remember what it was about. I'm like, airplanes or something? I don't know. Uh, 6.27 is the one I want. Yeah. I know, right? Not as relatable, I guess. All right. This one, I wanted to use this one because I want you to see that with this um, type of information, there are so many different questions that we could ask, right? And so we're going to focus on, on one little itty bitty section of this, right? But there's a lot of information here. And so the National Sleep Foundation conducted a survey on the sleep habits of randomly sampled, okay, few transportation workers and a control sample of non-transportation workers. So the results of the survey are shown below. Okay? And so we had the control group, of course, because we need to be able to compare all these transportation workers to something. But then we have pilots, truck drivers, train operators, bus, taxi, limo drivers, right? And so there's different groups that we could talk about. And then they had to answer, okay, do you get less than six hours of sleep? Do you get six to eight, six to, six to eight, six to eight hours of sleep? Like, I need six to eight. Um, <laughs> more than eight hours. Okay, and so, and then we have the results, right? And so some proportion of pilots, for example, get more than eight hours of sleep. What is that proportion? 51 out of 202, right? And so now we have these sample proportions that we can work with, right? We can do crazy, crazy things like, oh, is the proportion of pilots who get more than eight hours of sleep significantly different from the proportion of train operators who get more than eight hours of sleep. That's not what we're going to do, but um, that's something we could do, right? Because now we've got this freedom of uh, we can compare two samples to each other. Right? Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, turns out they're pretty rare compared to the six to eight, but still pretty good. Uh, so we are asked to conduct a hypothesis test to evaluate if these data provide evidence of a difference between the proportions of truck drivers and non-transportation workers, which is the control group, okay, who get less than six hours of sleep per day, right? Which uh, that is, they are considered sleep deprived, yikes. Okay. So the category that we're interested in is the less than six hours of sleep category. In fact, the only groups that we're interested in comparing for now or for today is the control group and the truck drivers. There they are. But this applies to whichever sleep category you wanna talk about and whichever driver category you wanna talk about, right? Just doesn't matter. But we're told which ones to focus on. So you can see how I could make so many different questions out of just this table, all right? All right. First, how about we establish some notation? I'm gonna let C be the control, of course, and T is gonna be the truck drivers. Hey, they have the same number of successes, fun. Not the same sample sizes, so not the same proportions, right? But kind of a fun twist. So we're given that the number of successes in the control group, a success in this case being less than six hours of sleep. I told you it's usually a bad thing, the success. 
it's a thing we're interested in, right? And so is 35. And the number of successes in the truck drivers is also 35. We're told that the number of uh, participants in the control group is two nine, oops, 292. And oops, sorry, it's an N. Looks like an X, I know it was. And for the truck drivers is 203. Using this, of course, I can find the sample proportions. Let's do that. We know we're going to need them. Or I guess I'm telling you we're going to need them. P hat for C is XC over NC. P hat for the control group is 35 divided by 292, which from my notes here, I get 0 0.1198603037. Oh, this one? Oh, just a big two. Aha, nice. I could squeeze this on here. I'm going to round to four decimal places, right? Unless there's a ton of zeros in your proportion. Four is usually safe. Point one one. Oops, is yeah nine nine. You can do the same thing for the truckers. P hat for T is X T over N T. So P hat for T. Oops, sorry. There is thirty five again, but over two o three which I have 0.172413793.1 to four decimal places, 0.1724. This is all before I even start the question, right? Yikes. But it's all, I mean, you're going to need it eventually. So you, you would be prompted, right? When you go to calculate your Z, the formula requires P1 hat and P2 hat and the pooled proportion. So then you, you'd be scrambling and, oh, okay, now I need them. Okay, great. But I'd just like to get them kind of out of the way. So we also need the pooled proportion. which I, I just denote it by P hat. I guess it'd be nice if I kept the pooled on there, but I don't. Rude. P hat is X for the control group plus X for the truck drivers over NC plus NT. So P hat, oh, I wanna keep it on this one page. So I'm gonna go across even though it hurts, 35 plus 35 over 292 plus 203, which is 70 over 495, which is 0.1414. Repeating, but I'm just gonna round it because there's a page break. Yeah, because we need that pooled proportion. So it doesn't care about which group it came from. It's just one pooled proportion. Okay. We were asked to do a hypothesis test, so I need to check the conditions. Okay. So first thing we're gonna do is check the conditions. Or if you wanna think about it as stating your assumptions, some, sometimes I find that that's an easier way to approach it because if the conditions aren't mentioned explicitly, then you're stating your assumptions. I assume that things were randomly sampled, otherwise I, I can't go on, right? I have to assume that. 
Okay. And so sometimes if it doesn't say, then you just say, oh, I assume that this is true. Right. Kind of like if I ask you how much you paid for your car, and then I would follow it up with assuming you have a car, right? Assuming you own a car, then how much, right? And so we do that all the time, but now it's more boring, I guess. No, Emily, stats isn't boring. I know it's not. I don't know where people got that idea from. Action packed. Independence. It did say that it was randomly sampled. So then we breathe a, a sigh of relief and we're like, okay, great. Right? The conducted a survey on the sleep habits of randomly sampled transportation workers. Okay. So I'm gonna take it a little bit further and say, okay, the uh, the sample the sample was randomly selected. So we assume independence within each group. Right. So we may assume independence within each group, within each group, and independence between the control group and the truck drivers. And independence between the control group and the truck drivers. Usually when I'm marking these though, I am pretty lazy. So as long as you say, uh, something about it being random and mention within and between. Uh, <laughs> you can make it fancy, you cannot, it doesn't matter, right? Just tell me it was randomly sampled or you assume it was, so we can assume independence within and between the groups, right? It can be that generic. Okay. Here, I'm trying to put, put a little spin on it with the control group and the truck drivers, right? Just showing off that I know which groups I'm talking about. Okay, but you don't have to. The success failure condition. Is just checking that we have enough successes and failures in each group and we do that using the pooled proportion. So N1 is 292 times the pooled proportion, which was rounded to 0.1414, which I have equals 41.288, which is greater than or equal to 10. Here, you can round, but I wouldn't because it's an expected number of successes. So I would just keep it as it is. Yeah. And one times Q hat, oops, Q hat is 292 times one minus 0.1414, which is 0.8586, which is 250.7112, which of course is also greater than or equal to 10. So group one checks out, All right? So here, this is group one. Right, which was the control group. I got sloppy and I didn't use C. I should probably use C here. Doesn't matter. I won't. Got too messy. All right. Group two and two times P hat, 203 times 0 0.1414 
which is 28, so kind of low actually, uh, 0 0.7042, still greater than or equal to 10, so we're still good, right? Yes. So for confidence interval, we use P1, P2, but for this hypothesis testing, we use the pool. That's right. Yeah, and for confidence intervals, yeah, you use the sample proportion, so P1 hat, P2 hat. And here we use the, the pooled, yeah, totally. 203 times 0.8586 is 174.2958, which is greater than or equal to 10, which means that group two generically or group the truck drivers also checks out, which means we can assume that it follows a normal distribution which means we can use Z scores to find probabilities. So that's what, why we check it, right? It's, it opens up all these doors. Technically, yes. In real life, there are different distributions that you can use. So there, there are other things that we're not gonna talk about, but they, ex they exist, yeah. Yeah, so then you'd have to look up, and I can't remember um, what it's called right off the top of my head, but there are tools where you don't use, you don't rely on the normal distribution anymore. Yeah, that's okay. We're, we're, we're not going to have to deal with that here, but it exists. It all exists. All right. This doesn't look like an equal sign there. Okay, so therefore, we can assume uh, a normal distribution with a standard error of P1 hat minus P2 hat equal to the square root of P hat Q hat times one over N1 plus one over N2. That's the one I prefer, right? Uh, or, Wars. Uh -huh. Or if you just distribute the p hat q hat over n1 plus p hat q hat over n2, notice that they're the same. But I like, I prefer, I use this one. They'll get you the same value, obviously. Okay, great. Now we're ready to start our hypothesis test. Just like that, it's, it's nice, right? It's soothing. So step one is to state the hypotheses. This is the first time that we're doing uh, kind of the steps of hypothesis testing with something other than a one sample proportion, but you'll see that the steps are all the same, right? I assure you, they always will be. The null hypothesis is that PC is equal to PT, or if you prefer, H naught is that PC minus PT is equal to zero, right? They're the same. But I like to have PC equal to PT because then if I wanna know if the control group is less than the truck group, for example, or greater than the truck group, then it's easier for me than having to think about what that would do to the difference related to zero, right? I know it's, it's not hard, but sometimes it kind of trips me up. So I know myself and I prefer to just have them. How do they relate to each other? But Maybe you guys are better at that kind of stuff than I am. PC is not equal to PTY. We wanted to know if there was a significant difference in the groups, right? And so here, let's go way back up here and let's see here. 
do they provide evidence of a difference between the proportions? This was actually our clue that PC is not equal to PT was our alternative hypothesis, right? Is there a difference here, right? And so here the different, wait, <laughs> highlighter. Difference means not equal to. Yeah. Which means it's a two sided test, right? Oh boy. So, oh, in a highlighter when I'm, I don't want to be, and not when I don't want to be. Okay. The alternative, if you prefer, could be that PC minus PT is not equal to zero. That's like the easy one when you're talking about the difference. This here makes it a two-sided test, which means what? It means that you have a, you're gonna need a two-sided p-value, right? The area in both the tails in step three. So we kind of, I like to make a note of it here and then, um, and then I can refer back to it later. Step two is do the test. Calculate the test statistic. From the formula sheet, right, we know that, or actually, how about uh, in general, right, Z is gonna be the point estimate minus the hypothesized value. divided by the standard error of the point estimate. That's always true. The point estimate in this case, let's develop it here, is P1 hat minus P2 hat, minus the hypothesized value, which if we use the difference, right, because here I'm talking about the difference, so then if it's, the hypothesized value is PC minus PT is equal to zero because we always assume the null hypothesis is true until we have evidence otherwise, right? So then here, this becomes PC minus PT is equal to zero. Usually we don't bother writing that because that's always gonna be the case, right? That this minus zero, how far is this difference from zero? That's what we wanna know. Right, so usually we don't even write that. Divided by, and what we said, the standard error of P1 hat minus P2 hat is gonna be the pooled proportion times, I don't know what we can call that, the anti-pooled proportion, I don't know. Times one over N1 plus one over N2. Or if you like the distributed version, ver version then that's fine too. Yeah. So from the formula sheet, what you have, right, is I give you Z, right? P1 hat minus P2 hat, technically it's always, Right. Minus zero since H naught is P1 minus P2 is equal to zero always. There are those special cases where it's not, but for us, it's always true. So then we don't even bother writing it, right? Makes it a cleaner looking calculation, but technically we're, how far is it from zero? Okay, this is where you would be prompted, right? you would have the pooled proportion from checking the conditions. So then you, this is where it would prompt you and say, okay, I need to calculate P1 hat and P2 hat, which we already did because I knew it was coming at us, right? And so I already did it, but this is where you would do it if you hadn't already, right? So it kind of holds your hand all the way through 0.11, I know, easy for me to say, minus 0.1724 divided by the square root of 0.1414 times 0.8586 times 
times one over 292 plus one over 203. I've got these values here. Z is negative 0 0.0525 divided by 0 0.03184075093. And I'm only rushing because I'm running out of time and these are just calculations. Hopefully someone confirms them later. Negative 1.64883046. Z, I really only need three decimal places to match the, the table. Z is negative 1.649. Okay. Step three, find the p-value. All right, from our table, I'm going to, come on, crop top this to be only the thing that I'm interested in. Yeah. I take the absolute value of Z, so 1.649. 1.649 would go somewhere here. So the absolute value of this would be 1.649 would go in here somewhere. Right. This is where I need to remember, okay, I actually just wanted a two-sided two -sided, two -sided p-value. So how do I summarize this in writing? I say something like, since the absolute value, of, and maybe I'll put it in the center, the absolute value of Z equal to 1.6, negative 1.649 is between these two values on the table, 1.645 and 1.960. The two-sided p-value is between 0 0.05 and 0 0.10. I like to highlight that I wanted a two-sided p-value. So it's already done that math of multiplying by two for me. I don't need that, but it's, I don't know, it's nice. Hold my hand a little bit. Okay. So then step four is the conclusion. And I know I'm running out of time, but I think it's, it's worth it. Okay. The conclusion, first thing we have to do is compare the p-value to the alpha level. Now, I don't remember if they gave us a p-value, they didn't. So what do we do? We have to assume 0.05. Right. And I'm also going to snag this because I'm going to re reword this as an answer. B. Oh, there, that's better. Okay. So since the two sided P value. totally fine, uh, is between, if you have to go, that's totally fine. But I do want to finish it today. Otherwise, I'll have to review it all Tuesday. Uh, so since the two-sided p-value is between 0 0.05 and 0 0.10, how does it compare to 0.05? It's not less than 0.05, right? Because it's between 0 0.05 and 0.1. It is not less than the alpha level, the assumed alpha level, right? Because it wasn't given. The assumed alpha level of 0.05, which means, 
we do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. We do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. Therefore, right? The question says, conduct a hypothesis test to evaluate if these data provide evidence of a difference between the proportions of truck drivers and non-transportation workers who get less than six hours of sleep per day. Therefore, these data, or however you wanna say it, using their weird wording, these data do not, do not provide evidence. So here's where, where we just reword it of a difference between the proportions of truck drivers and non-transportation workers, the control group who get less than six hours of sleep per day, that is they are considered sleep deprived. <sighs> You just reword it as an answer and you sound so clever at the same time. All right, that's it. Uh, hands up, step away from the plate, I'm done. All right, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise have a great weekend. See you guys on Tuesday. All right, stop this recording here.